Hello, hello, Cynthia Allen here. Very glad to have you. I hope there's a few of you out there watching. If you are, maybe pop a little comment into the, the Facebook chat so we'll know that you're there. And I'm going to be uh, joined, I am joined here with Donna Ray. She's an international trainer in the Feldenkrais Method, a psychotherapist and interpersonal neurobiology presenter. And she's always a delight to interact with. She's a speaker in the summit. Um, hi, Donna. Hi, Cynthia. And hi, everybody out there. Yeah, so I, I had this thought to post something on Facebook, which was to, to ask people what they wished their parents or their teachers or some people even responded what their doctors or healthcare providers would have known when they were a child. And when I was doing that, my mind was on that maybe we could use that to help us uh, be, be track important things during the summit even, you know, to track for important things during the summit, to wake ourselves up by reading each other's comments about uh, things that maybe we hadn't thought of before, or uh, maybe even motivate us to why, how, why the summit was so important. And then I started reading the quality of the comments and the, there was just so much heartfelt expression about uh, all of us sharing our own childhood experiences uh, around uh, trauma, uh, treatments, disability, being ignored, uh, misunderstood. And I thought, well, maybe we could do a little bit more than this with it. So totally, I just, you know, I mean, as soon as I started to read all those responses, I texted you and said, what do you think? Could we <laughs> do something here mm -hmm. uh, that maybe pe people could find valuable? Because it's not really a topic we directly address in the summit and this particular summit Dan Siegel uh, who you of course have studied with does address the issue of trauma a bit in children but not really how we can move through it ourselves so I don't know where should we jump in well yeah I think uh, there's so much to be said about this topic <clears throat> and um, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is um both in reading the comments that people have made about what they needed and didn't get, what they wished for, is that we could really raise consciousness and awareness to parents so that parents look at their children from a much larger viewpoint. So let's say, generally speaking, you're fed, you're clothed, you have a roof over your head. You've got those basics. But the next quality of existence that's so important is safety and security. And we talked about that before. So creating a safe, interactive communication with the child and all the people around them, you know, so the primary caregiver. So listening, repeating, asking questions. And what does that mean to you? Or, you know, if they draw a painting or draw a picture or paint a painting, you say, well, tell me about the process. What was that like for you? And you don't say, oh, that was, that's great. That's great. Because that's what we take. We have these default ways of interacting with people. So then that actually alienates people. It makes kids feel misunderstood. And this is so simple and basic, but primary. So from there, of course, you can go to much more difficult situations where kids are neglected or they're emotionally abused and sometimes as we know physically abused but primary communication is one of the most important things so um can go ahead well let me let me just ask a question quickly about that so let, let's say that uh, i as a parent had been neglected or abused or traumatized through the medical process is it enough that i i know that that happened to me as I go along to parent, is that enough? Or is there something more that can happen for me to not only make my life better, but then make it more likely that I can do what you just said? Yeah, and that's really key. So <clears throat> Parenting from the Inside Out that uh, was written by Dan Siegel. That was one of his early books. And in that book, he takes a person through this process of self-awareness. So to actually be able to listen to somebody else and let them have their say, whether it's a child or an adult, it takes a lot of self-presence and awareness. You have to sit still 
listen, absorb, not react, mm -hmm. be quiet, respond. And boy, howdy, that's really hard when you've got a, one kid, let alone two or three or four, because everybody's going different directions. So parents really need to understand how they can settle themselves and pay attention to their own children so they're not reacting to their past and bringing it forward and making assumptions about their own children. Because as you know, we're, we're creatures of habit. So we repeat our parenting, whether we want to or not. It can be subtle because we can make a decision. I'm not going to neglect. I'm not going to abuse. I'm going to take good care of my kids. But even with those very important decisions, if we don't do some introspective work and integrate ourselves, we come out with things that we shock ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we just react and, you know, swat the child or just, it's like these things are almost innate. It's terrible to say, but if you've been treated that way, you're going to repeat. And the only way to break the cycle is with self-awareness and integration. Mm, okay. Yeah. I mean, I think an awful lot of things that we all do to hurt, hurt people in our lives, we're mostly just unaware of them. I mean, sometimes we, we do them and then we go, wow, where did that come from? But a lot of them, we don't even realize that we're doing. And I, I think what you're suggesting is that in order to know that we're doing it, we need to, we need to do this awareness piece. So how would we, how would we start with awareness? How would we start with integration? Mm -hmm. Well, since we're focusing on the Feldenkrais method, when we practice awareness through movement, we are practicing self-awareness, self-reflection. What are we doing? How are we doing it? What is the quality of what I'm doing here? And as a practitioner, we want to really help our students bridge that situation so that it's not just taking place when we lie on the floor or sit or stand for that matter. So future pacing, sometimes we call it, how do you bridge so that you take that self-presence, the awareness, the ability to regulate your nervous system into parenting, into partnering with people mm -hmm. so that you slow down? That's one of the key aspects of what we do. And there's such a propensity to go fast, get it done. And with kids, it's like, get your shoes on, have your breakfast, eat faster, let's get out the door. You know, it's like every parent that's listening knows that this is true because the kids want to dawdle. There's no time for them. And so we need to allow for time to prepare and to stay in contact with the child. Now, one of the things that I have found in the process of parenting and working with children for many, many years is that when the parent or caregiver learns how to say what is happening, not what's going to happen next, you actually get the child's attention. And that can start from day one. Okay, sweetheart, I'm going to pick you up and change your diaper now. She actually talked to the child, to the baby, to the infant about what is happening right now. Mm -hmm. Many parents just pick up the kid, change their diapers, dress them, bathe them, but they don't speak to them about what's happening along the way. So say you've got a kindergartner, same thing, and now we're going to put your shoes on. You know, now we're going to eat breakfast. So you stay with them in the process. And I see what you're doing. You want to color that coloring book right now. And that's a lot of fun. Right now it's time to eat. So you keep it really present in your languaging. And there's you have a lot less reactivity in yourself when you stay present. It makes you stay present too. It's mm -hmm. very respectful. Mm -hmm. So as I was reading these comments, I felt like uh, some of us probably had done a lot of integration work. I can't tell you who, who, of course, I couldn't tell from those comments who has or hasn't. And some of us probably haven't done any integration work about our own story, our own past, or maybe, uh, maybe feels still unfinished. So if, if I have a story uh, if I have a past, which we all have, of course, and I think virtually everybody has suffered some kind of trauma in their life. I don't, I mean, I think it's hard to be come through life unscathed as into an adulthood without it. But Agreed. yeah, Agreed. but, but perhaps, I mean, certainly I think there are situations that people are more overwhelmed by than, than others. But, um, 
how could I maybe explore that in a way that would be helpful to me, but that wouldn't get me lost in mm -hmm. sort of the despair or the past? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good question because through practice with a professional, it can be a good friend, but it's real hard with a good friend because they react and then they talk about themselves. And what you, so if you think about a conversation bouncing back and forth, when we're in friendship with somebody, that's what we do and that's what's natural. So I say something about me, then you say something about you and there it goes, boom, boom, boom. That's very, it's, it's very enlivening, it's useful, it's caring. But when you speak to a professional, the professional can reflect back to you and in the process, ask you questions. What are you sensing? It's like, do you actually sense your whole self when you talk about that event? Mm. Notice your breathing, you know, and, and what happened at the same time as that event? What else was happening in your life? So you start to sense and feel and speak and you're listened and you're reflected and you recreate the, the story actually. So you were saying we all have stories, but you recreate your narrative so that it actually becomes a strength instead of a weakness. So I'll give you an example. A study was done a long time ago and I, don't, I can't cite it right now. But there's a lot of literature, as you know, about children of alcoholics. One aspect of being a child of an alcoholic or in an alcoholic family is that that child becomes very good at following subtle cues. They become very responsible. They're self-initiating. It's, it's kind of amazing. So when you speak to people, sometimes with trauma or alcoholism or drug abuse in their family, you speak to these people who grew up really fast. They had to get themselves to school. They had to learn how to dress themselves at a young age. So you actually look at the whole picture and you start to say, okay, and what did you learn from that? What did you take away? How do you feel safe now in the world? And then you can actually go you know, funnel into, and what do you need to do with yourself to be emotionally safe with an adult? And how do you create that safety with an infant or a child? So we don't erase the past, we integrate the past, and we look at it from lots of different perspectives because it basically does not go away. But the way that we remember it and tell our stories makes all the difference in the world. It changes who we are. Hmm. The way we remember it and the way we tell our stories makes all the difference in the world. So I feel like that needs a little more of an example for for me even um so I, i'm so if I, if I if i try to be a little bit uh personal so i can remember when in the early days of adulthood when i was trying to come to grips with my own uh, sexual abuse i used to say things like um um well i, I wouldn't have changed anything because it's made me such a caring individual mm-hmm like that worked for me for a little while. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that worked for me to take me to about 29, 28, 29. And then it was like, suddenly I was like, hell, I can't go for that anymore. That's just like a horrible way to learn to be an empathetic person. That doesn't work for me anymore. Right. Right. So then, you, so then I'm, I'm wondering then like how, it, I guess it probably was the process of, of, some therapy, some reflection, but it also seems to me it was a lot the process of the Feldenkrais work as well and other things that I did, art, mm -hmm. et cetera, that allowed me to start to rewrite that story so I told it completely differently. Yeah, so um, usually one of the ways that we respond to trauma is dissociation. Mm -hmm. So in all kinds of trauma and abuse, we dissociate. Even in car accidents, we dissociate. It's one of the ways that our nervous system takes care of us. So we have to check out basically when things are hard. But that can become a habit in your life. So when things feel uncomfortable, sometimes with intimacy, depending on the situation, sometimes in learning actually, if we're scolded, humiliated and shamed in learning situations, we go into a Feldenkrais training program and when you're learning, you dissociate. 
-hmm. Okay, so what does that mean? It's like, it's, it's very different for each individual, but somehow it means that you're not in the moment. You've, people experience it like fuzzy vision, right? They feel numb. Yep. They, their mind goes to something else and it starts looping and repeating. Mm -hmm. So we have really tricky ways to get out of the current situation. Well, if you're in a Feldenkrais training, for example, or in a classroom or an individual session with a person that you're speaking with, you can start to recognize when you shift and you're not there anymore. Yes. You can use your breathing to be, bring yourself back to safety and say, I'm okay right now. This is where I am. I'm not there. I'm not in the past. I'm not imagining that moment of the car accident or whatever happened in your family. And so you work with yourself to be safe and be here now. And we learn how to self-regulate and manipulate our own nervous systems. And the Feldenkrais method is so powerful in that way because it's working with sensory motor integration, which affects everything we do. We're always moving. We're always perceiving and making sense out of the world around us. So that's an ongoing process and we often need help to do that. We have to describe what's happening. We need to be seen. So I think I think what I hear you saying, I, I just feel like there's a whole lot of skill set in there. So first, if we look like we're to say, just to use my situation, my story actually was a way of dissociating back then. That original story I told myself was the a way, and it was a very good coping mechanism for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then and then it falls apart. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually we all have some kind of moment where things start to fall apart and our, our old coping mechanisms don't work for us so well anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a period of it of life seeming a, a little chaotic and out of control. And for some people, this happens when they have children. Like they go along really well until they have their, their children. And then suddenly a lot of things from their childhood come up when they have their kids. That's right. Because they start remembering what it was like to be that child. That's exactly. They see that innocence. They see that beauty. And then they realize, oh, my gosh. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so okay. then that's yes. the time to really be reaching out then for some mm -hmm. additional help. Yeah. And you're saying we could use and I certainly experienced this for myself that you can use the Feldenkrais method as a as part of the way of regulating. It doesn't yeah. have built into it listening to people's stories per se. So that's mm -hmm. not really a part of the Feldenkrais training. But that might need to be with somebody that's trained in that aspect. Mm -hmm. But the Feldenkrais work could be really valuable in this regulating, being able to find yourself back present mm -hmm. and okay over and over and over again. That's right. And I want to emphasize what you just said. When we have babies, we relive our childhood. And so if people have not done their work, they feel very stressed and sometimes incapable of parenting the way that they thought they would because they're emotionally flooded. You don't sleep for months, by the way. Sleep deprivation is a given with an infant. It's a given for many months. So just deprive somebody of sleep. You're going to regress to a certain extent. You need help, you know. Caregivers need to work together. We say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, extended family, helpers, neighbors, they're needed with infants and small children. And with children with a disability or special need or illness, uh, that can go on for years. It's not even just an infant situation. That's right. So people need help. They need reflection. They need support. And they need somewhere to go to talk about these things that are coming up for them. The, the memories that are uncomfortable so that they can sort them out and reorganize themselves and show up for their kids. Like you said, and with, if you have a child that has special needs, the demand is much greater. So learning the coping mechanisms of parenting in general and with a special needs child is, it's a very tall order. Mm -hmm. So the story that we end up being able to rewrite is then a, is not a story about not having had trauma, but it's a story about our resilience, I think, perhaps. It becomes a story about our resilience. It becomes a story about our capacity to thrive in spite of that situation. Would, would that would be correct? 
Oh, absolutely. And resilience comes from the things that we're mentioning here. Asking for help, getting help, having friends, having people that support you, having people that support your children with you. And yeah, you don't forget your past, but you reintegrate it and it's no longer the focus of your life. You actually train yourself to be present. And that sounds so difficult, but it's really not. We're being present right now. It's like we're talking, we're really thinking about how can we be useful to people? What can we mm -hmm. say in this time mm -hmm. that from the knowledge base that we have in our practices that's going to be helpful and useful to people? That's the most important thing. Nothing else is important right now. And that's how you really begin to live your life when you're engaged. And when you're shifting off, you're tired, you come back and go, okay, what am I doing right now? And you're interested. But the way to do that is to actually integrate all the aspects that we mentioned, your sensations, your breathing, what you're seeing, you know, the tone of voice, your cadence, slow down. It's like hear, notice your hearing. When you're stressed out, you don't hear as well. Your little tiny muscles in your ears tighten up too. You know, you stop breathing, you tighten up in your chest and your tummy. It's like all the apertures close up but you can just open them back up again and go, right now I'm safe. Right now I'm doing this. And this is all that matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I personally feel like the Feldenkrais method was huge for me in that way. Um, that the, the, the sort of process of spinning off unconsciously into difficult past times and then getting mired or sort of stuck there for minutes, half an hour's days on end, whatever it was, uh, seemed really like beyond my control. And um, I did learn some nice things in psychotherapy about it. But I have to be honest that I feel like the things that really allowed me to choose to be in the present came from the Feldenkrais work, mm -hmm. where I could, I could find my feet on the ground, I could find my butt on the chair, I could find my breath, I could... Uh, notice, I could begin to notice when I was spinning off into the past, mm -hmm. um, which is Im so important for us to make that distinction that you made for us a little bit earlier, which is that reliving trauma is what happened in the past, and but keeping it current as if it's still happening. And it's mm -hmm. nothing that anybody would choose. I don't believe anybody purposefully chooses it, but it's a skill we can learn mm -hmm. not to do. That's and that's right. not the same as dissociation. It's not dissociation. In yeah. fact, you know, so many, the people that I work with have described this to me, both in training and in therapy, and I experienced it in myself, is that <clears throat> with awareness through movement and in functional integration and in conversation, you start to tune in to these subtle shifts in your state. We call it state shifting in the Feldenkrais method. And it can be so subtle and you can be in contact with people looking at them, but there's a way in which the eyes go flat and the view is back instead of forward. And if you're tuning into somebody, you can see them doing that. I do it now on, in my Zoom practice with people. Mm -hmm. And then you bring them back. It's like, take a breath, where'd you go? What happened? And many times people say, I don't know. It, I wasn't aware that I went away, but now that you mention it, yes, I was no longer engaged in our conversation. Mm -hmm. What happened? And I, it's a very subtle shift in the neuromuscular organization. But as soon as you start to sense it, to feel it, you bring yourself back and you start to see again outside of yourself. So parenting can be an ongoing practice of this because you want to see the child that you're with. You want to see your own baby. You want to be with your own children. You want to be with your partner, your family. You don't want to be withdrawing and going behind this veil. It's, it's, not, it's not invigorating. It dampens your energy. Yeah. And so there's this process of presence, practicing being 
being here now. And as we do that, we explore the feelings, the thought, the sensations, or even the very implicit long time ago memories held in our systems through habit. It's not like in your shoulder, in your gut. It's not in a place. It's a whole system. It's a nervous system changing and adapting moment to moment. And it's trainable when you understand that it's a habit. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. And I, I think that uh, that gives a lot of freedom. By the way, I know there's some people watching on Facebook. And if you have a comment or a question, please pop it in your Facebook comments. It should pop up over here for us to respond to. Um, and we'd love to love to be able to see those or to answer any questions or uh, comment anything you have to say. I mean, I think with that, I think that realizing that it's a habit uh, gives us power. Mm -hmm. gives us power. So I, I think about rewriting that story. And in the end, I think that when, as we rewrite that poor power, that story of, of resilience, of being able to thrive, of being able to change our habits, then it becomes, it becomes the uh, hero, hero wins journey, right? Like out of more like the mythic Joseph mm -hmm. Campbell, uh, Gene Houston, all these folks that uh, I'm not getting the right names that, Marion no. Woodman, Marion Woodman, I think it was right. These folks who led the way in these in these mythic stories, it becomes more like that kind of a mythic story that we can be sad about what has happened to us, and it did happen, but we can be so proud of how we have learned to stay present anyway, and to and to and to be here now and to thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to love ourselves. To love ourselves. To love ourselves and to forgive ourselves and mm -hmm. to accept. That's a big part of integration. It's really taking care of yourself and saying, yeah, I need these things. I need love. I need care. I need friendship. You know, I need to learn how to nurture my children the way that makes me feel really good about myself. It makes them feel loved and they love themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it goes back to that safety again, but forgiveness is part of that too, is that human beings are flawed. We all make mistakes. Our parents made mistakes. And somehow they were doing what they did. And sometimes we say they were doing the best they could at that time with what they knew. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a big stretch in some situations. I know that, and it can sound very superficial. But when you do deep work about forgiveness and acceptance and integration, you actually pull all of that inside of you and you bring it forward with a depth of understanding that people feel and know in you. They know you've done your work. You can't fake it. You know, mm -hmm. when you're with people, you know, if it's a, like you're saying, it can be a, a strategy for survival of saying, yeah, I beat this. I'm who I am. It made me a compassionate person. But you can't really rest on that if you're going to show up and work with other people, if you're going to really show up in love and intimacy and caring. You have to confront the, the discomfort of being a human being. It's uncomfortable to be a human being. Yeah, and I think the the issue is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. I mean, Dan Siegel's uh, talk, by the way, is very worth listening to. As is your talk in the summit. You're on the same day. You 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 are and Dan Siegel in, and Dan Siegel says at some point, look, life is is hard. Let's just get that on the table. It's hard. And I was like, what? Dan Siegel's life is hard. <laughs> there's a little there's a little piece of me yet that sort of thinks maybe there's some people's lives that aren't hard. And it's just uh -huh. my life that's hard, you know. But life is difficult. Life is challenging. There are, of course, beautiful times, wonderful times, mm -hmm. uh, but but it has a lot of challenge to it. And I, I think that this whole issue of forgiveness, uh, you've raised two, two important aspects of forgiveness. And the one that I tend to focus on the most is the forgiveness of oneself. Because mm -hmm. the, the challenge of being someone who could be hurt mm -hmm. and all the ways in which we responded to that is, is a it's uh, something to reconcile mm -hmm. with that humanness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That vulnerability. The vulnerability, the humanness, and to feel that and be able to move 
And that's also a, an, an example of state shifting. Mm. So entrusting oneself, which is a very big process also, to be able to trust and feel the discomfort, to even feel despair, and then to be able to shift is enriching. It's like it teaches us self-respect, self-trust, adaptability, flexibility, but you can't pretend those things. There's anguish. We've all felt anguish and pain and discomfort. So you can feel it and you move, but you can't keep blocking it. To do those things, we often need a, a professional, somebody that can sit with us, that knows how to be there when you're moving through deep felt emotional states and then learning how to move out of them and acknowledging. And then you, again, you feel trustworthy in yourself. You don't feel like you have to deflect. You don't have to avoid and deny. And it also eliminates projecting those things onto other people, even your children. So we're talking about some work here, actually. It has yeah, I, I I agree. We really are. I, I and I think there's something really beautiful about a a good relationship with a psychotherapist, mm -hmm. um, and so I I totally uh, think that finding one that you feel can work with you until you can reach some level of trust within yourself and them is is very 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 mm -hmm. worthwhile if these are uh, issues that you're struggling with. And really, there's a lot of times in life when it can just be helpful. It doesn't have to be something like this. It can just be helpful because mm -hmm. I, I liked your example in the beginning that we, as friends, we do tend to be more like back, forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, and we don't, I don't personally really enjoy playing that role for my friends of just listening and me saying nothing for hours on end. Mm -hmm. That's That to me isn't really what friendship feels like to me right so but i i i think it's very different when it's part of the relation the agreed upon relationship yes with a professional right and you know uh, a skillful feldenkrais practitioner knows how to listen so they listen if it's an individual session and they're it's a very intimate situation you're putting they're putting their hands on you they're supporting you they're following your breathing and people often, they, they cry, you know, tears roll mm -hmm. out of their eyes. And, and the practitioner doesn't, it's not our job as a Feldenkrais practitioner to interpret or probe, but you show up and you say, I'm here for you. Feel that and let, you know, let that go. Feel it and now notice this when I move that. And people breathe and they shift and they're integrating their thoughts, their feelings, and their sensations. It's a very subtle, gentle process. Mm -hmm. And when the student feels safe with the practitioner, they're doing their work. It may not be explicit, but in that trusting relationship, being touched in that kind, gentle, focused way, they are doing tremendous integration work with their past, mm -hmm. their memories, and they're bringing themselves up to date. So the safety of that relationship creates this kind of healing. Although we don't call ourselves therapists, it is therapeutic. It absolutely is. And I think there's an integration that happens through the movement work and the, and the hands-on uh, individual work within your emotional state and your body that is difficult to get to through psychotherapy alone. Exactly. I, I, I mean, I really think it's difficult to, to do it all. But I also think that for some people, not everybody, people will also need psychotherapy. So it goes both directions, that there are two different skill sets that can marry up really nicely. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, maybe Dan mentioned this in his talk, is that you learn how to monitor what's going on with you, which is self-awareness. So you're monitoring yourself, including your sensations, your breathings, your breathing, your emotional fluctuation, the waves of emotions, mm -hmm. your thought processes. And as you do that, that's the monitoring, that's the awareness of self. And the act of monitoring and developing self-awareness, it actually changes you. That mm -hmm. changes you because monitoring modifies you. It mm -hmm. just happens automatically. That's the beauty of the practice of self-awareness. 
And then there are all kinds of benefits, time changes. We have these expansive states. We're able to comprehend things that we couldn't comprehend before. Conceptual ability opens up. And you know, when our talk um, previously, I was talking about awareness for movement in children and how their perspective changes. So when they are doing the monitoring and modifying through movement, they realize where, what is up, what is down, what is right and left, what is underneath. And their world opens up because they actually understand spatial existence. So they see that they're interacting with the environment around them. And, and then curiosity comes up. What else can I learn? And they start to sense mastery in themselves through movement and learning. And I think that, you know, when we go back to this question, what, what is needed for children? And I, I spoke earlier about my experience. In my family, I was loved and cared for. All the basic needs were met, but nobody tuned into how I was having difficulty learning. So I had to figure it out the best way I could. And sure, there were lots of challenges and misunderstandings along the way in my educational process. But my parents, it did not occur to them to ask that question. They just looked at me and go, okay, well, maybe she's just not that smart. But I'm, I'm intelligent. I'm a really eager learner. I just had difficulties. I couldn't hear very well. I couldn't see very well. I was dyslexic. So you take a kid like that. I was highly verbal and interactive and playful and humorous. So I looked fine from the outside. But nobody probed. There was no probing in the educational system or in my family because they didn't have the sophistication in those days. And I still think that today in so many situations, kids are just, they're just, you know, they fall to the wayside. Mm -hmm. And it's such a sad situation. They are, they have special needs. They need to be recognized and taken care of, you know, in these ways. So if we could raise awareness and consciousness about that too, so that parents include how does the brain work of my child? How is their nervous system processing? It, it would really expand parenting. I think it, I want to recognize this comment that came in from Facebook, and then I want to continue on with that, that mm -hmm. thread. So someone wrote in and said, thank you. Child thoughts, childhood thoughts looping in my head as a habit is a light bulb moment. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. No one, uh, no one said that to me, but it, it was in the Feldenkrais training that within the training itself that I started to realize, oh, I can change this. I can actually develop a different habit about this. And I started to be able to like notice when my, when I would start to slide off into like a triggered or post-traumatic sort of state. Mm -hmm. And that once I figured that out, it's like it opened. I mean, it was work. I'm not saying it's not work. It's mm -hmm. not like it just like magically happens. I had to, I had to go, is that what I really want to do? Mm -hmm. Here I go. Is this the direction I want to go? Mm -hmm. I can't, oh, maybe it isn't the direction I want to go. What are my other options? And I had to work it for a while. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how long that was, but it was a good long while that I worked it. But you begin to feel that power in that I don't have to be re-victimized constantly by my replaying of all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that light bulb for you was knowing that too. It's like, oh, I have something to do with my thoughts. I can change the way my brain works. Yes. You know, neuroplasticity exists. We're changing neural pathways using the Feldenkrais method. Our thoughts change. Our emotional processing changes. Sensory integration includes those. All systems are working together. It's a dynamic system. Mm -hmm. And we're tapping in to change the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks. Keep, keep writing any other comments. I want to go into this thing about uh, kind of like looking past children. See, I've, I've been noticing uh, for the people that I'm around and interact with um, that when we don't know what to do, we sometimes look away. Mm -hmm. that, that it's easier to look away because there's so much complexity in being a human. 
And then we, we see this person floundering, you know, we see something or we see something not quite right. You know, we, it's like something's not quite right there. And mm -hmm. then I think there's something that happens like a kind of our own kind of level of dissociation because mm -hmm. we don't know what to do. Right. Like there's, we don't see that there's, we don't have enough information. So I do feel like maybe the Feldenkrais work could be really helpful in that way that we become more able to be curious and not judgmental about these things that don't seem quite right. And maybe we could then reach out a little bit more. Well, you know, I think what you're saying too is that <clears throat> when we recognize that something's off in somebody, we often come up with a label. Mm. Oh, they're this. Oh, they're that. You see? So even in my case as a kid, oh, well, she's just an average learner. It's like she's, you don't expect for her to get straight A's because she's just an average learner. Well, that certainly isn't true. You know, as I developed, I could get straight A's. It wasn't that. I had to deal with some basic problems that were in the way. So by labeling, we, we put a lid on it. We stop inquiring. So if a child is not doing well for some reason, inquire further, you know, actually demand teacher conferences, talk to the special eds teacher, talk to the speech therapist, talk to the audiologist, you know, go back to your pediatrician, ask lots of questions and don't stop. Don't, because they are very likely to give you a label for your child too, or for yourself, but don't buy it. Keep probing, keep asking. Don't take no for an answer. And that's what I see with the parents um, that bring their children to me for Feldenkrais lessons. They jump through so many hoops and they've usually tried so many things before landing with a Feldenkrais practitioner because we're not as known. And then they feel so grateful that they see the changes in their child with the Feldenkrais method that they were not getting, you know, they were not getting these kinds of changes and results. So you have to tenacity, you know, don't take no for an answer. And our, our tendency is to want to sew things up and go, oh, that's just how they are. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, think it, I, think it, I think it makes us feel better to do that because then it's solved. It's solved. And if you keep asking and pushing, you you get sometimes you're pushy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh that's no, there's no doubt about it. You get, you, you get labeled as pushy and anxious and mm -hmm. neurotic and all mm -hmm. an over controlling parent and um, all kinds of things. Yes. Yeah. So with awareness, but frankly, they haven't done their work either. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's just, I mean, that's just a sign also of other people that haven't done their work, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So we want to we want to utilize the knowledge that we have in this field of neuroscience now and apply it to ourselves and our kids and really know that we can change. We can develop. We can go mm -hmm. beyond what we think our stops are. And that's one of the things that we learn in the Feldenkrais method is whatever you think you can't do, oh, actually we make the impossible possible. <laughs> and it's and it's gentle. It feels good. So there you go. You have the counterbalance for all the anguish and the difficulty you've had in the past in your own learning and in your life. You start to go about things with a with a sense of mm, what feels good. How do I need to slow down? Maybe I can breathe a little bit more. I could find another way of doing this. It's so empowering to understand the principles of the Feldenkrais method and put them to use in your daily life and with your children. Mm -hmm. your loved ones. That's a beautiful place to end. And I also think it's a beautiful way to encourage people to take advantage of the uh, Facebook lives happening every, well, for us, it's every afternoon, I think at 1 p.m. that Tiffany uh, Sankari and Joe Webster have organized where different practitioners are dropping in now for a few days to give you a short awareness through movement lesson because you can experience what Donna just described for you in those lessons. 
And then within the actual summit every morning, we every day we release three awareness through movement lessons with three different practitioners, again, to give you that experience where you can start becoming present, mm -hmm. integrating, being aware. Such a wonderful opportunity. There's more and more Feldenkrais uh, learning situations available now online. Mm -hmm. And I thank you, Cynthia, for being such a, a big part of that. It's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joe Webster, for hosting us. I know you're back there somewhere, so you can end this as Donna, Ray, and I both say goodbye. Take care. Bye, everybody. <laughs>